happy Thursday. Thank you very, very much for tuning in to this week's publishing in transit. Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 988th New Social Environment. I'm Eleanor, a Programs Direct Associate here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC for a conversation featuring Dan Macklin, Aidan Farrell, Isabel Sobral Campos, and Cole Swenson. And now I'll introduce today's guest and guests and host. Dan Macklin is the founder and executive director of Future Poem Books. He is a poet, performer, editor, and designer of digital things who lives in New York City. His work has appeared in the Brooklyn Rail, Balm, and other publications. Aidan Farrell is the managing editor of Future Poem, where he has worked since 2018. His translation of The Vitals by Marie de Catra Barb is forthcoming with World Poetry Books. He has published also two chapbooks, Lilac Lilac and Organism Algorithm. Isabel Sobral Campos is the author of two full-length poetry manuscripts, How to Make Words of Rubble and Your Person Doesn't Belong to You. She has also written several chapbooks with her latest published by Above Ground Press. And our host today, Cole Swenson, is the author of 17 volumes of poetry and a collection of essays called Noise That Stays Noise. A book of hybrid poem essays, Art and Time, was published by Nightboat in 2021. Cole has also published over 20 volumes of poetry, prose, and art criticism from French, and won the 2004 Penn USA Award in Literary Translation. It's such a joy and an honor to have you all in conversation on the NSE today. And with that, I'll pass it over to you, Cole. Thank you so much. And thank you all for coming. Um, as <clears throat> you might know, Publishing in Transit is a way of trying to put the spotlight on the people who do all the work that actually gets poetry out there in the world. And there are often people who don't get properly acknowledged, we think. So this is a chance for us to hear their voices and hear what they do and how they do it. So we're going to start with a couple of readings, uh, and I'll pass it over to Aiden, who will read first, and then Isabel, who will read second. So Aiden, go for it. All right. Um, yeah, thank you so much to Cole, um, Eleanor, and everyone at Brooklyn Rail for inviting us. This is a real treat. Um, uh, I'm going to read uh, a poem from a manuscript in progress. Uh, the poem is called Vicariously. Nothing a family can do about it. A singleness of purpose comes to blows in the area of inner experience, in which you are presently determining what attributes do not describe a possession. A partnership expressed as something altogether else, yet all at once it is clear that this kind of looking has not since ended. These days, living alone looks particularly appealing, not only because it seems pleasant, but because you have been holding off for a moment conducive to expression that is often called a chance to surface your vision of yourself. But this desire has not been compelling enough to stand an aftermath, even if you were to consent to the belief that all people try to avoid pain by any means available to them. It happened inside reality. It happened and it appeared to be told that to become a man, a boy must first completely fall apart in the street whilst having qualities ascribed to them from afar. Psychologically moral, yet physically vicarious, to feel comfortable in solitude in many empty rooms with the lights switched off and you were able to close the doors behind you, unprepared to meet or be met by the categories as you embarked on the task of processing each circumstance anew, all unto their own specific tasks. The effort cripples you despite unacknowledged expectations about what would happen next. 
not enough candor invested in casting an unspontaneous and dull, willful and demanding avoidance of old sludge. And you didn't know that if you run, you only encounter the road and cannot revise the script or its sustained credibility. If you had a perfect liaison to rescue or to rescue you, would you do for it something sinister and risk feeling sinister in so doing for which you would have to be present? You realize a transformation has affected you as stubborn, uncertain, and irresolute as you are. There had been a bridge you knew to cross. You barricade yourself within the walls of your townhouse and begin to see that you had no choice in the story you hold on to, except that you are still holding on to it. That the necessity for disclosure should ever end prompts the motion into a slow unraveling of events and isolates you for fear of being discovered along the way, becomes a precious gift of space where the possibility of complete acceptance can survive your informal contract with irony, whether or not words fall into what did not occur to you to say out loud. Thanks. Thank you very much for starting us out with that. That was great. And Isabel, if you'll carry on. It's um, wonderful to hear, Hayden. Um, I'm so excited to be here today. And I will, um, and thank you all for inviting me. Um, I wanted to read from the forthcoming manuscript with a future poem. It's a long, um, it's a, the poem is the entire book, but and it's in a th three sections. So I'll I'll read from like the third section, just an excerpt from it. To scour an image off its cerement, its pliable, gerund refuge, to beat and tarnish it with a caring whip, uncertainty burning, morbific. The image coils suspended by a retinas poison, hallucinatory debris. Shards spewed out, shrapnel of sentience, sharded, extinguish the flare, pebble it through incarnadine blanks of memory, sprout incarnation shells, that spasms jolt us from drowning, insensual image of discordant ontology, suffuse vagrant, plain, expose, gangrenous daguerreotype. Relinquish it, let it drift, poached imago vine sinking, to wash an old image, exuding incubus, the truth to touch. An image repelled by its own imprint, the shape of an inscription within it, the lump of weight fumigating the throat. To speak it, you must disown it. Antiquated hoarding an invasive frost. Scarlet shape of opening a ray planted between flickering lashes. The crimson colorant absolute spiral toward the figure of forgetting. Curl with an ovule funneled shaft of stigma wall. Curling concretion seeped abrasions, curling the wasp air. Curl supernal eye, relinquish the equestrian eyes. Optogram four. Seagulls ravaging the seashore, they swoop down to the mandible of the ocean. They consume the salty mesh of waves. They digest the fabric of sentience fumes from the darkest blue on their beaks. They carve in and out of liquid spray cannibalize what swallows us, submerges us, destroys, and oozes onto the factual flesh of having a body. The image of a fear itself, an embodied squall. It dives into the retina. It swallows the eye's radar, frames the impossible. 
It sinks to where the imposter within demolishing what remains inside. I am. His head dunked into the cold ocean, sees the whiteness of gold, the fierce beaked darkness of gold. The wind lives in its wings. The wind and the seagull are one. Optogram five. The feeling of insulin shots against his inner pocket break. The image more accurately, a thin strip of light, a needle. The image more accurately, an elongated, narrow apparition, an arrangement of lines. The form, a psychic assembly you cannot dispel, a crass entanglement of emotion. The image or the memory of a feeling, a feeling or the trace of a sensation. The light pattern results, however, glittering strip poised against skin, a retinous production without external stimuli, the beak, the point, the strip of light. To wash a sea wave start at its uppermost coil, you dive, sink your face onto water with palms stretched before you and open your mouth. The brine would choke a caliphic seance hails from a rupture, inconceivable limit. Brandish your impervious spells onto the twirl that follows the rapt trance within this circulatory joust. Mummified, you are iteration in this, the meaning of voyage and passage, the expulsion sinking discharge. You are radiating ideological bulk, downward, 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 plus perfect light to be coiled in your arms and think of dying. Now stop there. Thank you very much. Great to hear that work, really nice. Uh, and I think now we're going to segue into some images and Dan, do you wanna lead us through them and Dan and Aiden? Sure, everybody. Right. Good. Thanks so much to, to Cole, Eleanor, Chloe, and Carolyn, everybody at the rail for having us today. Um, just wanted to say that again. Um, so these are, uh, I'm just gonna do a brief introduction and turn it over to Aiden actually, uh, but uh, this is our book page on our website. Uh, a design is sort of uh, one of the defining uh, the, the the relationship between the design and the work, I think, has been a journey that's that's central to to what Future Poem is and has has been since the beginning. So, um, and we're fortunate to be working have worked with a series of really dedicated designers um, who have brought their vision to the to the project. And um, for the last number of years, we've worked with Everything Studio. Um, Tom Griffiths and um, Jessica Green, who are New York-based design studio, and they design all our books um, and work very closely with the authors. And um, we also our website and our identity as a as a press. So um, with that, I'll I'll turn it over to Aiden to say a few things about um, some of the recent books. Yeah, um, yeah. So these are two of our most uh, well. Violet's uh, In Lieu of Solutions is our most recent release, and Miren's book came out a little over a year ago. Um, and it's sort of, it's a little hard to know where to begin, I think, <laughs> where the design process starts and ends. But I think um, um, the way I try to think about putting a book together in general, from a design standpoint, as well as just from the book as an object standpoint, is like creating the um, the right frame for um, a text that that we've selected, and um, I think of that very much in kind of like the um, literally the sort of like painter comparison of like you know a painting needs a frame to be put on the wall, and so part of what we're doing is like a platform to create um, a sort of like 
physical expression of the text. Um, and I think, you know, coming at it from there, Tom and Jessica at Everything Studio are very into um, putting together books that um, don't really look like they would be books. Um, not necessarily from the sort of like structure of a book, but I guess from the cover. Um, the focus is very much um, on text and sort of um, various mutations of text um, across the page or across the cover rather. Um, and yes, Wendy's book came out on uh, update, I believe is October 1st of this past fall and Paul's book Nerve Curriculum was released in uh, April. Um, and an interesting thing, uh, you know, Wendy's book in particular, the first time I saw this cover, I was like, this is risky. Um, because the whole title is not on the cover, evidently, you know, and, um, and this is the kind of experience I have a lot with Tom and Jessica when I receive the sort of first drafts of the covers. I, um, I'm always a little challenged by them. And I think that is, and it takes some time to sort of like accumulate the visual effect that they're giving to me. Um, and that uh, sort of nature of being challenged, like in the process of creating and collaborating um, the books um, is something that I think is very like part and parcel to um, the ethos of future poem as a whole and the kind of um, experience we want to create for readers and for poets. Um, yeah. Um, I don't know. Dan, is there something yeah, you want to add? I, yeah, I think, I think you, I think that was well said in terms of, you know, just our, our, the collaboration that we have with authors. I, I also think it all comes from the fact that we're looking, you know, we're, we love to champion work that really is just re-envisioning the possibilities for what a book of poetry can be or a book of literature. Um, and I think the design is a manifestation of that, those conversations that the designers have with the authors are really trying to, to do justice and kind of have a way into this really visionary work that that is just unlike anything we've seen before in terms of what that particular author is doing. Um, and um, if you can go back to Marin's for a second, I just thought there was a, a really nice, um, yeah, and I, I think one of the, just just an anecdote about Marin's is the conversation about this lettering that was um, not actually Arabic lettering, but something, um, that was evocative of it, which was very important to Moran um, to to capture as part of this, um, you know, kind of cross cultural identity, which is such a big important part of this book. Um, so I think that's just just a, something to 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 capture just that the depth of that conversation that goes on design with the design process is really just. Um, part of the, just our, the care that we try to, um, the the care that we try to have um, to bring each of these books into the world. So I think that's that's just something I wanted to, to mention. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would add to that, you know, I, um, each cover, each book in general, we enter, you know, I do my best as editor to sort of enter into um, like a real relationship with our authors in order to sort of like um, get as holistic a view of like where this book is, where a book is coming from. And that's not generally so that I'll use that information to like for something specific, but just in general to create an open relationship where conversation and dissonance is, is um, can be held 
and often produces something that is more than what, what I could have come up with by myself. And that dynamic also goes for my relationship with um, the designers, the designers and the authors um, and so forth, yeah. One, one thing that seems striking about the recent covers is that they require deciphering. They're a little puzzle in themselves. And what I've found myself doing is getting kind of beneath the surface of it because of the figuring it out. And I wondered if that is something that you all requested of the designers or whether that was their idea, or is that just a coincidence? Um, I'd say, uh, I'd say that, you know, we work with Tom and Jessica because we love their sense. So I would say a lot of the sense of deciphering a cover comes from their, their design, their taste. I'd say that, you know, this is a, co it's a collaborative process in terms of like they present ideas and you know, it becomes a it becomes a sort of ongoing conversation for months um, about what is to be done um, and how to like move towards something that's more like a central place of agreement. Um, but I would say that you know, uh, they're the designers in this equation, right? And I try to remember my role as not designer as well and like it's really amazing to hear them speak about what they're doing um they have an understanding of design that i that i do not you know um and it's easy to forget that i think um for myself sometimes um and um yeah yeah i don't know dan would you have anything i think that i think i think that yeah, I think what you know, one of the things that Aiden said is just that in a way, feature poem is a very open-ended concept. And <clears throat> each of the guest editors that we invite have the leeway to kind of reinterpret that the way they want. Um, you know, we have these rotating panels of different people choosing the books in the same way the designers have been sort of come to the table and develop this aesthetic or this this set of you know, trajectory and design that's, they found their own version of what they wanted. They thought based on the books that we're giving them that future pump could be in this, like one possible future. <laughs> and I think that's, um, that's been really a rewarding process to, to see unfold. Good. Uh, and I think you had some other images. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so one of the things, um, I think that we we thought of when we, you know, as when I sort of originally started the press and as different people came involved is not that it could be something that extends beyond books, um, that it could be a platform that that has other um way, you know, other projects, other curatorial curatorial strategies than, you know, than where the books are chosen. And one of the things we've done is, and our board has been really involved in this is um, like a kind of creative approach. <laughs> this is a creative approach to fundraising is that we wanted a kind of a generative way of, of raising funds for the press, but that would also be give something back to the community or give some, you know, create something special. So this is something called the, we did in 2012. It's, called Messages to the Future. And it was a very simple idea, it was the idea of inviting a really wide um, range of artists and writers and um, critics to um, write their instructions or messages to the future people. Um, and we gave them a postcard and um, we got this amazing range of responses from um, just a wide range of people in the community, including some very noteworthy artists um, and writers. And um, I, I was just, we were all just blown away by how poignant and thoughtful and um, kind of uh, the responses were and how people took it um, 
kind of to heart to to these responses. And so, I mean, um, you don't have to be a Christian to appreciate Giotto. Um, you know, uh, these just this sort of um, just thoughts about actually thinking about someone opening this up in a time capsule. And it's kind of poignant to read now uh, this number of years after. Um, so if you can just page through to the couple of the other ones, um, crazy one from Charlemagne Palestine and, um, uh, you know, just visual responses, text, um, some people have these beautiful, um, you know, go, if you can go forward, there's some, um, oh, Lynn Tillman, there's a lot, of, there's a couple of saris <laughs> um, that, that people wrote, um, Lawrence Wiener, um, so just a really amazing, special, um, this one of my favorites, the Emily Von Wolf and um, paint, uh, watercolor painting um, drawing. Um, so it was just very um, touching and they sort of formed into boxes of cards that were actually um, sold to different institutions. So one's at Yale um, in the Beinecke collection and another one's at the University of Delaware. And, um, but I think just to say that, that there's this potential of this platform of future poem to kind of have different types of multi-artist projects that that this is one way that we've kind of had this conversation that goes beyond books about possibilities. Um, and um, you'll see a little bit later in the in the presentation, there's the, something for Future Feed, which is a newer digital platform that we've started that also is invites other artists besides our authors to participate in and and contribute and um, is is another kind of extension of of this possibility for future poems. So, um, and so I, I I these kind of continue to kind of delight in a way um, and um, and they're really they're poignant. Um, They really are this sort of launching the conversation outward. Uh, now, you mentioned the board, and I would love to hear more about it. It seems like they are an active board, which is not always the case with the press. But also, I'll let you talk about these images, too. Um, I'll, I'm going to turn this over to Aiden to talk about these in a minute. But um, just to answer your question, um, we've been fortunate to have um, some really dedicated folks be involved from the beginning. Um, first, it was just uh, as many presses, you know, a project that I started with a designer, and then it became a nonprofit um, organization very early on. And um, a couple of the people that joined early on were Monica De La Torre, um, Jeremy Sigler, were a couple of the original board members, and Jay Sanders joined on afterwards. And actually, the Box project involved um, Amy Selman, the visual artists and um, uh, Jeremy as well, who were board members at the time. Um, and we had Mimi Gross um, and uh, Monica Mansuto and Rob Fitterman joined more recently. So, uh, but yeah, we, they, they've been involved with these kind of projects for the postcard project and also, um, you know, just being providing guidance and curatorial suggestions. And they're very active in that they, they actually, we choose together the guest editors that choose the manuscripts every year. So it's sort of a, um, the board kind of chooses the curators who are choosing the work. Um, and, and so that's been a role with our board. Yeah. Right. Um, Aiden, I don't know if you want to talk about some of these events and images. Sure. Uh, this is a photo from the launch of uh, You Know How Much I Hate Being Alone in Social Situations by Stefan Lawrence, which came out this past June. Um, and the launch event was this past June. Um, it was a great event. Um, and this is from the double launch of Making Water an Autobiography of a Language. This is Laura Yaramillo author of Making Water. Um, and that event was at Artist Space and we were very grateful to be able to use such an incredible space for what was really like a highlight of an event for us in the recent past, I think. Um, being able to launch to, I don't know who that is, yeah. Um, being able to launch um, 
two books that came out at the same time that, um, you know, are not that similar, but end up being in incredible conversation with one another. That's the kind of thing that I think um, I want um, Future Poem to be about, disparate sources coming together to create something, to create, you know, a synthesis that's that's new um, in whatever form it occurs. This was me <laughs> at, um, at, I believe, um, the reading we had this past summer with a number uh, that was the launch of Paul Lopez's book, Nerve Curriculum. And um, we had a great list of readers, including uh, Tilman A. Goldsboro, whose book is forthcoming, whose book, Object 7, a Spirit Loosely Bundled in a Frame, is forthcoming uh, this spring, um, who will be pictured in a second. Um, yeah. Um, Miren reading from Autobiography of a Language at Artist Space. Um, yeah. So we also, as a result of uh, the pandemic, um, as all of us were, you know, we were fo forced onto Zoom. And um, I believe this was after things had opened up a little, but uh, Jessica Lazar, here, author of Planet Drill, was really into the idea of doing a Zoom launch um, as it can allow a lot more people to show up. And because the format of her launch was a bit different, um, she asked about, I don't know how many, but something like 15 or 16 readers to each choose a poem from her book to read. Um, and um, she started by reading one poem and then they all read their individual poems and then she read three more at the end. Um, and, and when it comes to like events and things of this nature, you know, we do our best to like leave it up to the author as to how the format sort of runs and how the community is like gathering around uh, a new book and how the book is to be celebrated within the community. Um, and yeah. I think I think that one thing that has been true or we came to as an organization or press as from the very beginning is we really tried to think about how the collective model can extend to not only choosing the books, but um, you know, it, it's part of our editorial process, um, but also our events, like the way that we kind of, um, um, you know, uh, celebrate the the premiere, the the start of the life of the book is is um, is you know often by invite asking the author to help us curate, you know, um, co-readers or or people to share. In celebration sometimes those people read their own works and talk about the book a little bit sometimes they're reading from the book um, we've had events both ways so um i think this is this is one where people read read from the book and it was really wonderful to hear kind of the book be read collectively by by a number of people that are important to the to the author so uh, that was a special event mm. And this is Paul with his book, Nerve Curriculum, outside his launch this past summer. Um, yeah. And, and sort of hopping off of what Dan said, you know, the launch and kind of like, I guess part of it is the publicity, which is a word that I don't love to use, but it's, 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 uh, it exists, um, is sort of in many ways the beginning of the life of the book. Um, and like what we work toward as a platform, you know, as a means of creating or like facilitating space for a community, essentially at the end, celebrating um, the reflect our you know self reflection in literature and in text, um, and um, it's very easy, I think, sometimes to go through the whole process of working on a book and then get to the launch, you know, and 
sort of, I guess maybe like fall flat on it, but I really, we really do our best to like ensure from the beginning that, you know, this part of the book's life is just, a, just as important as um, every other part of the process. Um, and kind of the most fun too. I don't know. It's very, uh, it's pretty validating, you know, at the end of a, at the end of a long process to see everyone together and also to see the stack of books that are finally there, you know, before you, um, yeah, this is a bigger view of artist space, um, with making water and the autobiography of a language, um, being sold and our cool little, uh, bookmarks that I love that were designed by Tom and Jessica as well. Um, difficult to decipher. I think that I'm uh, like consistent with that. Um, and uh, the following picture that I saw for a second is um, the launch, the Zoom launch, which was in the middle of lockdown of Lindsay Che's um, Transverse, the cover of which won um, I forget the name of the award, actually. If, if you the AIGA uh, right. design award, yeah, which is out of which is out of Sweden, and that's this book. Um, very difficult to see in this light, but maybe it's that one, um, which we, we we saw earlier. Um, and uh, another great example of an author kind of changing what a book launch can look like, um, Lindsay. Um, invited a number of authors to read and then they played a piece that they were composing um, of electronic music on Ableton and it was um, it was difficult to know what to expect um, you know and it turned out to be as well as the fact that they um, shared their screen so we could look at the sort of program itself where the music was designed. And it was, I don't know, it was, it was definitely a very new experience for me. And I was really um, happy to have helped facilitate that. Um, and it was a very successful event as well. Yeah, I think both Lindsay and Max Crandall, who who's, was part of that event, um, at Max's own book launch, I think we've been very open and and been happy to um, for authors that actually wanted to take their book celebration to performance realm. And um, Max, for instance, had a, a book party in, in collaboration with uh, Housing Works where there were really just a series of, of like video performances on Zoom and um, and kind of uh, kind of almost like online theater <laughs> performance. Um, so it was, it was something inspired by the book, but, you know, not, not a traditional reading. And that was really, we were happy, you know, I think it was, it was a very nice um, inspired way to celebrate a book launch. Um, I wanted to, to quickly touch on then if you jump to the next um, images, mm -hmm. this is kind of what I mentioned before um, about this fact that we're kind of, tried in the last couple of years to, to really extend the vision of future poem to, to other spaces. And one of the ways that we've done this is um, starting a platform called Future Feed, which is actually a separate site from our main website. And um, it could be thought, you know, I don't like, I think it's more of a platform, digital platform that has um, visual essays, um, people sharing their inspiration of their reading, um conversations and interviews between authors um and the person who um has just recently um moved on from future from um from curating this it was ariel yellen who really took this idea and and um, came up with this idea in, in collaboration with others at the press and um you know really developed it and 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 invited this really diverse, amazing group of artists and writers to participate. Um, and so you can check it out. It's futurefeed.net. 
Um, and we're, we're really happy to have this as, as, you know, there's some, some overlap between, um, the authors participating, but a lot of people who have participated haven't been authors. And that's really added to the sort of the, you know, growing the conversation, of, um, of the press and the group of artists that we serve and, um, and what we can bring to, to our readers and public. So, um, it's been really an exciting process to develop this this platform. Yeah, I would say that um, in the same sort of vein as the as the postcard project, this, as Dan just said, you know, is an extension of of, of our or not an extension, but a sort of partner to our book series. Um, and um, yeah, and the person who's taken this over from Ariel is Zoe Tuck, who's been involved with the press um, for for a few years and has, re has really um, started to develop in, it in um, her own direction. So, um, so we're really excited for Zoe Zoe's curatorial vision um, bring bring, uh, bring her her vision to this project as well. Which is very exciting. It's very exciting to see this space um, evolve, you know, and take on new shapes and new characters. Um, yeah. And this is just the last slide. It's just our homepage and an event that you should all come to if you're in New York on Saturday, okay. which is uh, Wendy, Wendy Latterman's book launch. So uh, with these wonderful co-readers, um, including Marin. So um Hope you hope you can make it if you're in New York. One thing that really stands out is an inherent internationalism. And I would just love to hear more about how that came about. Obviously, Brooklyn is an amazingly international place. Uh, but is that a particular emphasis? And maybe let us go into uh, thoughts on translation, too, because I know that both Isabel and Aidan are translators. So um, anybody want to comment on any of that? Be great. Well, I'll say a quick note, because I'd really love to hear from Isabel and Aidan on that. Um, but um, I think that it's been an aspiration um uh, of of to to try to have non-us or uh to, to try to have non-us um editors and um authors participate in in the press um we had um uh, von Samproqua as a as a guest editor um who uh, was a french writer and translator and um and we've had, um, you know, people that have had cross-cultural backgrounds um, not, that, that may live in the U.S. And I think we're not a trans, we haven't done so much translation just because we don't feel like we could, we've talked about it, but it's not been something we felt we could take on and do well at this point in our um, um uh, development, but uh, oh, yeah, and just recently, we I would say that we've been fortunate. We we're fortunate to have two Mexican-born members of our board now, and we did have a Mexican writer. Um, and Aiden, correct my pronunciation, but Gabriela Jiraki, Jiraki, uh, was a guest editor recently, um, who is somebody who writes in English and Spanish. Um, so um, anyway, that's just a little bit of what our thoughts and we'd like to do more and future feed is obviously one place that we could do that in, in a more um in a, it makes it more possible to do projects that that may involve um writers from outside the u.s oh you're muted paul Oh. Excuse me. Thank you. Um, I kind of want to go in two directions at once. One is to pursue that translation issue and, and hear how translation affects both of your writing. And the other is also, um, Isabel, I'd love to hear about the perspective of a writer, someone who's not an editor of this press, but is an editor of your own press, and how it is to interact with Future Poem as an editor yourself. So maybe let's start with the translation and hear from both of you and then hear from Isabel on that question. 
I want to hear from me. Uh, translation. Um, well, first, in in terms of future poem and future poems, um, internationalism. I suppose. I mean, um, I think. Well, I'd I'd like to note um, that there are two sort of recent books that um, are bilingual, and this idea of um, much like what I think is to be communicated about text with our covers is um, a sort of breaking down of borders between, I think, physical as well as conceptual borders around areas of thinking, um, as well as uh, languages themselves. Uh, Lindsay Che's book, Transverse, is bilingual um, Korean and English, and Rosa Alcolo's book, My Other Tongue, um, Spanish and English. And so I think we're very interested in like transgressing boundaries like that. Um, yeah. In general. Um, for me, translation is, is a pretty new, new part of my practice. Um, and I'm not sure I have like incredibly fully formed thoughts about it. I, it's a very, um, uh, intuitive, thing for me um so I, i'd and i'd rather hear i hope that's not a cop-out i'd rather hear from isabel on this. no no happy to translate uh to translate to 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 talk about translation um well i guess for me translation is something that i've always wanted to do and i'm i was very slow at getting into but i um have my first translation actually coming out. But um, for me, it's very connected to my identity as a writer in that I'm a multilingual writer. I grew up speaking Portuguese and now I write in English and as a way to kind of think through a genealogy of, of both, um, you know, through languages, how I was shaped into a writer that I am, that's one. And the other one also in, um, in a, that's, Kind of this feeling that I had that I'm a student of of a kind of poetry I like that it's a world uh, treasury right it's experimental poetry conceived broad, broadly and so it's a way to contribute to the availability at work that um, often it's is not translated it's not put out there so it's a way to do that um, but specifically with this actually there's a connection very quick connection between the book that i translated and my manuscript for future poem um uh, which it's uh, a bit macabre but <laughs> that's okay uh, you know, um, i'm translating this book by Salat Tavares, and one of the things that i'm very drawn to her is one, one thing that she does over and over again which is to um, you know, play a lot with sound and by doing that kind of pulling words apart but when when she pulls words apart she's really trying to kind of reveal a, a, another word inside of the word okay and so she does this with the portuguese and so it's this pulling things apart and it's the sound play of course but there's also this new semantic that kind of gets unearthed and kind of erupts right of, of that and um i i was very drawn to that idea but doing that in relationship to english and how when you pull away in english words you can find other smaller words that actually are in another language. And so they belong to both mm. kind of linguistic realms, right? So one, an example that I'm going to give you, and that's what I mean about being macabre, macabre <laughs> was the word cadaver, right? If you pull the word cadaver away, you have kada, which means like each and vir, which means seeing. And that question, a cadaver, kada, kada vir, cadaver, the, the corpse, but of course, each thing was something that got me this question about how the eye sees death that then got me to research all the things about op optograms and made the book in, essentially come from this idea along with other ideas, the book that Future Poem will publish, do you see? And that came from me being translating Tavars and thinking through that double, double, like, it's not so much that there is a way in which you can write into languages at the same time, but there's a way in which there's this sort of like superimposition. I love that idea of that superimposition, um, which is neither nor, and then it's kind of wobbly. And um, so, so yeah. So and I and and most of all, translation to me is absolutely to that people should be reading Tavares, you know. And so if I can do that, um, I I'm so delighted. I mean, it's so rewarding to be able to do that. 
Um, but so, I don't know, that's um, for the first part, but there was a second part, <laughs> which was, I think, remind me. Oh, uh, about the perspective of you as a publisher yourself working with this press. And uh, I also was just interested in hearing from the outside. We've heard <laughs> from the inside a lot about the press. What's it like from the outside? Yeah, no, no. I mean, I think anyone who here has done any publishing knows it's such a hard, such hard work. <laughs> and uh, so I have gratitude and admiration for anyone who puts out a project. I've, I already told Dan and, and Aiden this, that I was um, like a fan <laughs> of this press for so many years. And of course, what that says is that you're reading the books of a press does and, and they are, they, they are, they are the, the models, the, the, the inspiration and it's sort of like where you go to think about I want to I want to have this feeling reproduced for other like I want this feeling as a writer to come from my writing and right and here it, it is so in some way they are sustaining writers right because they are giving you at least I, that's how I feel honestly about future poems books so many books that they sustain me as a writer um, I hope as a publisher that I produce books that sustain others as a writer as well as myself right I want to publish things that I read and that I want to study because they're yeah, mind blowing, right? And so, um, um, you know, every every um, publisher is thus forming a com you know, board feeding and forming a community of um, writers, readers, and whatnot. And um, I don't know. As a publisher, I hope that I that I, that I do that. I. Um, really admire the, the 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 sort of the commitments the future form has to a kind of collective and collaboration i feel like it's a, such a a democratic ethos is so um having what's put out into the world emerge from from this kind of conversation consensus you know versus a kind of top down like uh um so i think that's really beautiful and makes me um you know, really honored that the, my work would be among, you know, within that ethos of a, of, of a kind of collaboration. Um, and I, I also think that one thing, one thing that I would say that the press that I run with my sister, Sputnik and Fizzle, shares with um, Future Poem is this, is this always thinking about ways of how does the conversation you try to do by publishing these books that you admire and study and whatnot, kind of translates into other projects that again, are, are beyond the books, they go into the realm of performance, they go into like platforms of discourse and we need that so much, that sort of, you know, kind of social space where people can come together in that, um, in really vital ways. Um, so I, that's something I certainly was searching for, for my press and uh, it's not my press, but you know, the press that, <laughs> that I work for with. Um, and that I think that I really uh, like hearing today. Um, and, you know, I follow Future P Feed, so it's not like, um, but I don't know. <laughs> Those are my two cents about, <laughs> about the, 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 que the questions. Um, I'll pass it on to um, others. I, I was thinking, uh, it seems like collaboration and community is so foregrounded by the press. And one of the structures that I imagine really supports that, and I think is a very unusual structure, is the guest editor panels. And I was wondering how they actually operate. Do the three or four get together and make collective decisions, or is each one on the panel making his or her or their own decisions? Uh, how does that operate? Well, uh we make it a little challenging for people in a good way by somehow arriving at this number of three people and two books. So there is sort of a compromise or a uh, consensus uh, mandate for consensus that's sort of built into that um, model. Um, but it really, uh, I mean, we aspire to make it a conversation. Uh, it used to be a very in-person meeting in my living room uh, when that was when, when that was possible, um, and now it's it occurs on Zoom more often. Um, and you know, it's it's always a really fascinating and rich process because um, 
there is often agreement about maybe one book and then it's more difficult to kind of reach agreement about um, the other book and there needs to there needs to be a, a kind of a, a decision about sort of what's the pairing because that actually is really important as well it's a it's an idea of a curatorial pair, pairing um, between these two books so sometimes even if there's um, affection for another book because we get so many great books sent in we might decide or the guest editors might decide that they really like the conversation that's occurring between these two books for that year. Um, and it feels like they, they need to be, they, they, they should be highlighted together. So that's, that's kind of um, uh, a little bit of, of the process um, in my view. Yeah. I, um, <clears throat> excuse me. I, um, this this sort of uh, I guess kind of ratio of like three guest editors to two two books chosen every year and the potential like friendly conflict that that can that that can sort of um, catalyze I think is really important uh, and really central to the identity of Future Poem in terms of like how our catalog is put together. Um, the collaborative model is one, and, and I mentioned this on, a, on our earlier call, that, um, you know, accepts dissonance as a positive and as a generative um, condition of working together with people. And, um, and it's incredibly exciting for me, um, like to let go of, of some of the authority and become more of a, of a sort of facilitator as editor, you know, because it's often, it, it, I mean, it's usually not one of my first choices that ends up being one of the first books, but I like that challenge because it forces me to um, reorient myself. And often, you know, it's like my, it, it, the collective reading of, uh, of a number of books, I think is always more generative and, and and more accurate probably to what a book is doing than any one person's reading. Um, and so it's kind of based as, in this idea of like collective and discourse and the function of literature within that. Um, yeah. And I, and I would just add one note that I, I think, you know, like any project we've been sort of adjusting and evolving and kind of correcting for different things that so there was the guest editor model and then we kind of at some point realized as there are things that maybe don't happen as much or that we want to have more direct curatorial control over um and more of a voice as people that put in the labor of the press um uh to to kind of choosing some of the books so we introduced this other features award um uh in addition to the to the open reading period and that's been a great process because in addition to the what the guest editors choose we've chosen another book every year um and um, um so that's how isabel's book was was chosen and and we've had an, uh, some wonderful additions to the press and they were able to kind of look for work that we feel is maybe missing from some of the work that that come that that comes with this sort of organic unrolling process of the guest editor panel. So that's been a really nice um, addition to the to to the um, the the catalog or the series of the press. Great. I noticed we're at the top of the hour, so maybe it's a good moment to segue into the audience for your questions or comments. Uh, so I'll turn it over to Eleanor to go with that. Thanks, Cole. Um, and thanks for this really generous discussion and description of Future Poem. The work that you all do is really incredible, and I'm so grateful we've been able to hear about it. Um, we've got a couple questions here, and if anyone else would like to ask a question, please feel free to send a message in the chat um, and or raise your hand. Um, so our first question today is going to be from GE. Thank you, Eleanor, and thank you all. I, I love this this joyousness of, of the energy of publication, which I really get from, from hearing today. I first heard about the whole project uh, 
from the uh, NOS Disorder Not Otherwise Specified uh, project, um, which seemed to be way ahead of its time, and, and I think sort of still is because there's projects like that out there, but just don't seem to come close. Can you talk a little bit about that project, how it came about? You know, where, where you know, um, any anything you can tell us about it, because I just love to know about the origins and everything else about it. Thank you. You know, I, um, thank you. I also love that book dearly. I think it was a little bit before my time, though, and I think Dan is probably the better person to talk about it, if, if, if you'd like, Dan. Sure. Um, I'm so glad that you mentioned that book. I feel like it deserves, you know, every bit of attention um, that, that, you know, I, I love that when people find it and they're drawn to it. Um, so that actually was, I think, our, I believe, our first collaborative book that was, um, that was published by um, uh, Matthew Cooperman and Abby Copang. Um, and, you know, it, it's, centers around their experience, sort of a documentary poetics work, centers around their experience with their daughter who's, um, um, you know, on the autism spectrum and has some, uh, you know, um, challenges developmentally and, but they're, you know, they're this sort of um, loving relationship that they have and, and just sort of the process of, of um, you know, ongoing series of, of crises, you know, of, of dealing with um, some of the, the challenges medically and, and otherwise, and that those are represented in the sort of uh, the, arc, the artifacts in the book. And so there's this kind of exchange, uh, uh, conversation between the poetics and the artifacts that are in the book, and it's very powerful. And I've really enjoyed watching, it's one of the examples of a book that can kind of uh, have a life outside of the poetry community um, in that the, because of the subject matter and um, the sort of um, interest, you know, circles of interest of that type of work. So it's really um, been, been really um, exciting to kind of watch that, um, that, that, you know, the life of the book, as we say, is like of that particular book. And um, so I'm really glad you, you brought it up. Um, and and again, very interesting process of the design of that book too, because they they really were vocal about things that they cared about and wanted to bring forward. So um, anyway, um, thanks thanks again for mentioning it. Thank you for putting it out. Thank you so much, GE. Um, that was a great question. We have another question here from Susan, um, and Susan. If you'd like to unmute, I'll give you the chance. You should be able to if you'd like. Or if not, I can also read your question out. Um, Susan wrote, love the discussion and the readings. Thank you so much. What a treat. A question for Isabel. Can you talk more about opt optograms and how pulling English words apart informs your work? Sure. <laughs> yeah, so um, the optogram is this uh, kind of really fascinating 19th century phenomenon where um, the belief or the, the, the hypothesis was that you could um, pull, um, dissect a, a, the retina of a dead. Um, they actually did it with rabbits first, then with people condemned to death. Um, you know, dissect the retina and actually uh, extract an image, which would be the last image that they saw upon dying, right? And the and so, and the, uh, you know, you can see the principle there is that the eye is like a uh, like a, a like a camera that would that takes shots, and that you could, you know, pinpoint that point. And um, there was a, a, like a, an interest in the uses for law enforcement <laughs> that you could actually have the you know, that section of a victim's eye and therefore they would see their their killer or whatever. And, you know, you'd have like hard evidence there and, and whatnot. Um, and uh, it, it's, it, it, you can't do that, right? You can't, that's not a, just, just putting it out there that it's not possible to do this. But the, the, the idea of um, trying to um, 
look like look at uh what is past in the case of my manuscript or history through that um first with that desire to ascertain um without a doubt a, a kind of real that you, you never have access to right everything you do looking back as though it's a uh, an exercise in a kind of subjective recovering of you know um always you know managing and and struggling with all the slipperiness of of everything right and uh, on the one hand um there's in my book really talking about like the national myths of Portugal as a nation and the stories that Portuguese still today say and tell to each other and their children through various means about what colonialism was, what slavery was, right? And so um, as a figure to, you know, it's a kind of, it's more, I, I don't want to so much explain it because for me, so many things, but for me, it, it was driving the book and in that act of looking, um, um, that it's impossible, but people try it anyway, <laughs> and um, and so on. So in that sense, but what, what what I brought the word optogram in relationship to translation is because cadaver, like each seeing, got me thinking about this idea, and which I got a, a little bit obsessed about and and found out about this technology, um, but not so much in the manuscript for future poem and my other manuscripts and things that I worked on. Um, I um I I do a lot of that sort of messing with the words and um I'm a fan a fan of concrete poetry of in and of kind of you know making something visual with the, with the text so that's why I'm drawn to that and so of course when I found out Solari's work I was like this is amazing <laughs> and mm -hmm. and put my energies uh, translating it uh, quite hard to translate actually because of all these like really. Uh, untranslated no, they are, you know you you figure out something but kind of challenging I suppose um so I hope Susan I I answer your question but um you can look up the 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 images of optograms they're really kind of haunting and um like really haunting and feels like almost like this ghostly kind of images and 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 look at all this fascinating history of that um that work but yeah wonderful thank you so so much as well um thank you susan for that question i am um, i would love to ask you all a question um i think probably anybody might be able to tackle this one but i'm really um interested in the methods of collectivity and collaboration that are used at future poem um, and I'm wondering if you could share a little bit more insight into that process and what it looks like and maybe feels like both from a perspective within the organization and Isabel, if there's um, something for, as an author that you may like to speak about related to collaboration, I would love to hear more on that. Um, well, I'll start. Um, I think I already talked about how we as a the board itself is involved in kind of thinking each year about who we want to bring in to the conversation of the guest editors part of the picture and i think one of the things that we've tried to do um i know cole mentioned international feeling of the, you know ethos or whatever of the press but also we 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 really i think maybe it's come forward with some of the postcard projects we shared, but uh, the kind of the idea of like interdisciplinary practice. And it's definitely true of a lot of the authors we publish that they have that kind of practice, but it's also true that we try to bring people onto the guest editor boards who might have that type of practice or not even poets. Um, we had Richard Maxwell, who's um, you know, experimental playwright or director. And um, we've had, you know, um, uh, you know, a lot of different, we've had artists on our board, um, visual artists on our board who also happen to maybe write <clears throat> some text. So that's one way. And then I think, it, as you saw from Future Feed, we also try to extend it, um, the community aspect of it. We try to build, building a community, maybe that's, that's you know, larger than, than is possible just with the authors that we publish, but kind of, you know, has a conversation with those authors. So those are couple of ways and then through the events I think 
I think we've tried to say like, how can we make these events more community oriented by inviting more voices into them or um, inviting people to respond to work. That's something we did in the past. Um, so that's that's some thoughts on that. I don't know if anybody else wants to, um, Hayden or Isabel want to share some, some, some thoughts on that as well. Yeah, I, um, I mean, I think one characteristic is that you know, it's been touched on a little bit, but, you know, the sort of, like, there's no, like, uh, sort of, there's not really, like, a hierarchy of authority or, or like, what anyone says goes. Um, and, you know, I feel like I'm the king of saying to our authors, we're a, we're a press of, uh, we're a small press of limited means, you know, um, which I, is the state for for small presses and um i think what seems to happen uh when there's limited means is that there's an increased need of community and that becomes kind of uh you know quote unquote wealth i guess um and uh so there's not it, it it's 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 a bit of a necessity as well as it is a um a decision, like a conscious and collective decision to pursue a team sort of work kind of, kind of understanding of these roles. Um, and roles are sort of like fluid as a result. And, um, you know, for, for example, like I, um, and like, we're currently trying to find ways to sort of like celebrate our readers um, who are, you know, our readers of the first sort of the first readers of our submissions, because the work that they do is um, uh, just like wildly important um, for everything that happens as a result. It kind of, in many ways, like begins uh, with them, the process of selecting and the process of publishing a book, uh, you know, um, and I started at Future Poem as a reader. Um, so I have firsthand experience of this, uh, which is great. I mean, so that, for example, you know, it's like, yeah. Yeah, I went, when the, you made me realize that one important person that we didn't mention um, was Ahana Ganguly. Uh, who has joined us the last couple of years to and is sort of shepherding that submissions process and that kind of conversation with uh, both the uh, you know everything from these initial readers to the guest editors and um, you know is you know sort of taking ownership of that like making a great experience for everybody who submits to the press and kind of respectful communication about you know what, that they're where their work is in the process or what our decisions are so I think that's been really appreciated yeah and the way that Ahana decides to you know or the way that you know our submissions coordinator decides to run submissions I feel is just as consequential a decision in how books turn out or like how our catalog turns out as designing the cover you know, um, it's 100% part of the editorial process as well. And, um, and it is a full job in itself, um, for sure. Um, yeah, does that, I don't know, did we tag team that, <laughs> that question well enough? I, I just wanted to say thank you for mentioning the readers. I think we all need to thank the readers of poetry because they're the engine that keeps it going as well. Yeah, amazing. Thank you both so much. Um, we have our, our final question today from Fong. So Fong, you should be able to unmute. Thank you, Eleanor. Thank you, Isabel, Dan, Aiden, and of course, Cole. And uh, I love future poem books. I have several copies myself, which bring to, to mind, you know, when you start out, doing something similar nature as ours, what we've been doing. Um, for me, it was so important to be an admirer of Blast magazine, even though it was only three issues. 
existed. This is my favorite publication. Wyndham Lewis, Astro Powell, and Henri Gaudier Vresca. And of course, the other had been Seven Arts, which only existed 10 issues in one year, 1916 to 17. And I remember talking to Susan Howe and my friend Charles Ruhr, who interviewed James Laplin about New Direction. It was so interesting that he went to see Astro Powell in Rapolo. I think it may have been uh, Gertrude Stein who sent him there. And he saw his poems, his poetry to Powell, who essentially say, you're okay, poet, but I think you better uh, have a better, better go at it if you were to create a press to support other poets. So that same, I think a year or two later, when he graduated from Harvard, he came to a lot inheritance for a kid in 1936, $100,000, I think. So he, he created New Direction. <laughs> so it's, was there any similar inspiration from the beginning? <laughs> Somebody who had said something to you all to launch out to this incredible adventure. Was there an admiring publication? I don't know. Oh, I mean, I think there were a lot of a lot of things. I'll mention a few. Um, as I said, it was a conversation with a started as a conversation with the designer and myself, Anthony Monahan, who we worked together and we wanted to do, a, you know, make a book. <laughs> so we we did this, and one of the things that Anthony brought to it is he he loved the the record label 4AD Ooh. and and the the beautiful sort of way that they thought about you know each each album so um something that was the same size every time you know that's something that's like uh sort of indicative so that was a design influence i also you know i think the discrete series in books um like from zero to nine mm -hmm. uh, Bern, bernadette mayer and vito akanshi series and like uh, Lynn, Lynn and Ginny and the Telos editions, you know, that, that there was like an event every time the book came out, it was really special. Um, yeah. That's those, those kind of projects, I think meant a lot to me. Um, and I was always kind of happy to find them somewhere because <laughs> um, they weren't always available at that time. So, um, or see them. Um, so that's just some of the, uh, but I think that, the, and and I think just lastly, um, the collective models were, you know, were inspired by a lot of people, um, like Kripskaya editions in the West Coast had a, had a sort of an idea of a rotating panel um, mm. as well. So those are all those are all things that that definitely inspired um, the way that we we evolved. Cool. Well, that's terrific. We could only do that through our critic page. Every month there's a <laughs> different critic come on and populate that whole space and whatever he or she or they would like to do, undertake their own subject of interest, you know, so it's super unpredictable. But, um, so thank you, you guys. This is terrific. It's, uh, I was, every month when we put the issue to bed, I always love to be, you know, re-quote what John Steinbeck say, book publishing business, make Court racing seem very stable. So <laughs> congratulations to you all. And uh, please keep up the good work. Back to you, Eleanor. Thank you, Fong. That was a, a really nice question to end on. Um, and a huge thanks again to Dan and Aiden and Isabel and Cole for the really wonderful conversation today. Um, and now to conclude, I'm so thrilled to welcome Dan back on to the virtual stage to end us with a reading. Thank you so much. I'm going to read a few recent poems. i start with this one. One believes it's the sea or a coming together of loose ends but this is only a hand grazing your face, prompting you to look up between beats which are no longer in time. Rubato, these unfurling sequences of peripheral sounds. When you awake too early, yearning for quiet, 
watery haze, flowers decapacitated in a placid stream. A stop and start, a stillness, cancellation signals, beaches are pointless, arguments, muffled guttural sounds as if one's vocal cords never worked. Everything feels absent, unpublished, inexact, misfiled, out of print. Between these moments of emptiness and when we're reattached, we're frozen under glass, interspersed with ads, a fabric, a desire, crisp page turn. Lights so cold, neither on or off, everything in distance floating precisely, always. Sometimes blue threads sparkle, something I forgot or thought I forgot, a joke, a paragraph, this occupation of a window where listening occurs. Laughter tunneling inward, fake adoption letters you both receive and write. Signal speeches, a natural detritus, volcanic sands, missing tooth, a cantessa in a bone church, elastic silence where we speak, we witness, undertake, go missing. And these two poems are inspired by um, the amazing graphic artist, Dame Darcy. Forget existence. If your aura travels independently of your body, thousands of miles away, it may forget the way back. Or perhaps you've been dead so long that the momentary blip of light which was your life seems a distant dream. Because I am in and out of time, turning a corner, or creating an intricate spiral lock, just as Mary, Queen of Scots, secured her final letter, with nothing but the very paper on which this poem is written. Forgetting a word, a name, folding time itself so that a moment when you feel particularly lost gently dusts the cheek of an instant you were ever so certain. Existence forgets. If your thoughts move too fast or become too complex, existence forgets what you were thinking about to begin with. For example, here a dragonfly is whizzing past your field of vision. When it passes, you wonder, was that an actual living thing or a floater in your eye? Or here is the face of a person you meet on the subway platform and don't recognize. As you flash through every possible scenario and time period to desperately excavate how you know them. A silent movie slowing down or speeding up frame by frame. Kids in high school spinning pens. People laying down in a field forming words captured from aerial photographs. Once I was mistaken by an older poet I tremendously admired for another tall, skinny, bald headed white guy poet, and he signed my book for the other person, and I said nothing, accepting the responsibility of choosing not to remind him of my name, later receiving the most generous email of apology and generously and generosity, which I cherish to this day, along with a signed book in my collection, which I never mentioned to the other poet. Pointillism, skater spinning or diver diving, or for example, you were sleeping in a new bed after a fraught couple of weeks, forgetting in an instant, for an instant when you wake up, that you are actually in a different place. Prop circles, fireworks. Or the way when you hear a poem read out loud, you forget that someone assembled a series of words from the garage inside their head, or for example, from a mass of index cards thrown on the floor, or perhaps randomly flipping through some books they have been open for years, as if to tell a fortune, or retell someone else's story as if it were their own, or their own story as if it were someone else's. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for such a wonderful conversation and for all of your amazing work. And so great to end with poetry as well as to start with it. Yeah, that was such a beautiful reading, Dan. So many lines I'm holding on to. Thank you so much. And thank you, Isabel and Aiden, for your beautiful readings earlier as well. Um, thanks to everyone who had a question today. Um, and thanks to everyone for tuning in. We'd also like to thank the Terra Foundation for American Art for sponsoring our NSC and for supporting our archive, which you can view on the Rails YouTube channel. The Rail has been free and independent for 23 years, 
A donation directly supports our writers, production staff, and operations. So please consider supporting our work through the link that's in the chat. And if you're free tomorrow, join us at 1 p.m. Eastern time for a conversation with Colleen Smith and Zoe Hopkins on the occasion of Colleen Smith's show, The Wanda Holman Songbook at 52 Walker. Um, you can now all turn on your microphones and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Thanks so much for being here today. Thanks for the poetry. Thanks as always to the rail and to Fawn. Thank Hooray. you so, so much. Hooray. That was amazing. Thank you. Thank you. So Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everybody. Thank you.